Victory can rarely be gained by fire alone. The object of fire is to prepare the way for a charge with the bayonet. Decisive victory can only be gained by closing with the enemy. These are points raised again and again by training manuals and the field service regulations of the British Army in 1914. But in modern open warfare, how does one actually get to within bayonet range of the enemy? In this video, We'll examine the training and doctrine which governed how the British Army conducted an attack and how they prepared to engage the enemy at close quarters. Any advance over open country within effective range of the enemy was made in extended order with a space of several yards between men. This had the dual advantages over advancing in, say, a column of making the line harder to see from a distance compared to a solid mass formation and of ensuring that if the line came under fire, the enemy would have to fight against a much larger front, decreasing the overall volume and intensity of fire on each individual man. However, it also decreased the volume and effectiveness of British fire. Narrow columns were a more manoeuvrable formation and were effective against frontal artillery fire, but within 1400 yards of the enemy, it became dangerous to use anything other than an extended line, and so that will be the focus of this video. The advance was generally led by the platoon commanders, as company and battalion commanders were to place themselves wherever they could best maintain communication and a view of the engagement. Their job was not to lead by example, but to make informed tactical decisions, although this could change in line with the situation. For example, at the First Battle of the Ain, when Lieutenant Colonel Adrian Grant Duff, the commanding officer of the First Black Watch, realising that he could no longer do much good as a commander when communications broke down, and trusting in the ability of his officers, began carrying ammunition to the platoon firing lights until he was mortally wounded. The salient point here is that a senior officer giving orders without the in-depth knowledge of the particular engagement possessed by his juniors was viewed as at best useless and at worst dangerous. As the 1914 Manual of Infantry Training states, superior officers should never trespass on the proper sphere of action of their subordinates. The platoon commanders the second lieutenants, or lieutenants however, would lead from the front so that their signals could be seen easily and have a better view of the situation in their particular area of the attack. The men followed a few paces behind, with the section commanders distributed in the centre and the flanks of the line, and with the platoon sergeant to the rear, ensuring that the line kept moving forward and that communication with the reserve and senior commanders was maintained by means of runners and signallers. A drummer or bugler with a piper in Scottish regiments, followed behind with the platoon sergeant. Soldiers trained extensively in moving from a column of march into an extended line as quickly as possible, a skill which would become of the utmost importance during the retreat from Mons in 1914. In the extended line, methods of advance varied, but generally involved a fast walk similar to the quick march or a series of short rushes. The slower walking pace could be useful as it forced the enemy to continually adjust their aim as the range grew constantly shorter and helped stop the men from tiring when weighed down by kit. Rushes were a more effective method for facilitating covering fire during the advance, particularly at short ranges, but either method included halts to fire, preparing the way for the charge. Shorter advances at close range could also be made by crawling if the terrain was not suitable for an outright charge. Maintaining the same speed and dressing along the line was essential to prevent soldiers from masking each other's fire, and this was ensured by the section commanders. During the early stages of the Second Boer War, it was identified that such was the rigidity of drill and training in that period, that if soldiers were not given an order to take cover, or their officers were incapacitated, they often failed to take any measures of self-preservation. Therefore, by the time new training guidelines were finalised in 1905, the use of ground and cover was emphasised almost to the point of exhaustion. Soldiers were taught to automatically use available cover when halted, or to drop and crawl to any nearby cover without being ordered to, and to ensure that such cover still allowed them to fire effectively. This was part of a general shift in doctrine at the time, which encouraged subordinate commanders and men to make these low-level decisions on their own initiative. However, command and cooperation still had to be maintained, 
and the men of the British Expeditionary Force were trained to recognise whistle and hand signals, as well as being given verbal orders. Fire control was also an important part of training for the advance. It is well known that the British Expeditionary Force was one of, if not the best trained armies in musketry in 1914, and this was applied in the field, with soldiers being taught to judge distances accurately and follow fire control orders to direct their fire onto a certain point, sometimes only forcing the enemy to remain behind cover and preventing them from retaliating, but mainly with the intent to inflict casualties. Extensive training in snap shooting, where a target is only visible for a few seconds in which the soldier must aim and fire, married the two principles of use of cover and fire control by teaching soldiers how to fire from behind cover quickly and accurately. They were taught simple, life-saving techniques, such as the method to expose oneself as little as possible by firing around solid cover, rather than over it. Cooperation and support between units was encouraged, but not compulsory. This again shows the level of initiative and flexibility allowed to subordinate commanders, as it was up to platoon commanders to organise advances covered by other platoons, or advances by alternating sections. This was usually achieved by close communication between units, utilising runners or semaphore. Support by covering fire might also have been provided by the battalion machine gun section. Whether attacking or under attack, the first concern of the commander in any skirmish was to create a firing line. This would be done, as previously mentioned, by extending into a line with several yard spacing and each man lying down or utilising solid cover immediately. If within effective range, meaning 1400 yards or less, or when the element of surprise had already been lost, a fire order would be given, specifying the range and the exact position to be fired on. For example, 300, right edge of small wood, dip in the ground, fire. From this, the soldier would identify the position, spot the enemy themselves if possible, and commence firing. The command rapid fire could also be given to produce a larger volume of fire, however accuracy suffered accordingly from the increase of speed, with less time being given to acquire a correct sight picture. The effectiveness of a firing line such as this, in attack or defence, can be seen in the case of the 4th Royal Fusiliers at Mons, who were able to muster a large volume of fire at more closely packed German formations, while presenting a far smaller target themselves. If a rush forward was to be made, a short whistle blast would be used by the commander to attract the men's attention. Not the long drawn out blast seen to signal men forward in many films, a long blast in fact being the signal for cease fire in 1914. The men were trained to look in at the commander on this short signal, and from there a verbal order or hand signal would be given to begin the advance, usually at the double. Hand signals were the most common method used to convey orders, as the extended line meant that most men would not be able to hear verbal commands being given from the centre. Orders were sometimes passed down the line from man to man, but this was not as effective and delayed the order being carried out. The line would move forward as one or by alternating sections, and scouts were sometimes sent out ahead of an advancing force, usually during a whole battalion advance. At closer ranges and with smaller units, however, such as was often the case in 1914, this was not needed, and indeed could endanger the scouts when the remainder of the men began firing. At the end of a rush, a verbal order or hand signal to halt would follow another short whistle blast, and might be followed by a signal to lie down, however this was seldom necessary, the men being trained to immediately take cover upon halting. During the movement, it was common for the line to gradually draw closer together, bunching up and creating bigger targets. In this case, the commander could order an increase in spacing by a whistle blast, followed by the relevant hand signal. As mentioned earlier, the ultimate aim of any advance under fire was to close on the enemy with the bayonet. Therefore, once the line came to within 100 yards of the enemy, this usually became its last halt, with the men again forming a firing line and continuing to subdue the enemy and weaken the point in the line to be charged. The infantry training manuals and field service regulations bring up a key point here, that the commander in the firing line will be the first to realise when the enemy has been subdued and superiority of fire obtained. Although it was sometimes desirable at this point to bring up reinforcements to aid the now tired men in the firing line, time was of the essence and it was up to the commander at the front to decide to fix bayonets and seize the opportunity to push forwards. A reserve may of course have been deployed to reinforce the advance at any point, but in a successful one it need not be sent up until the former's firing line had been established. Therefore, the usual course of action would be that the line would move forward as one body 
and charged the last few yards to the enemy at full speed. Keeping an extended line was no longer necessary, as the range to be covered would usually be less than 100 yards. Nor was it advisable, as the aim of the charge was to put as many bayonets as possible into a short section of the enemy's line. The volume of enemy fire might further be reduced by the use of artillery until the last moment before the charge, while also serving to demoralise the enemy. The regulations of the time also state that the charge should aim to attract the attention of neighbouring units to the fact that a breakthrough is being made, to allow them to join in. To this end, the commander would order the charge to be played on the bugle, the men would cheer as they ran, and in Scottish units, bagpipes would be played. An important point to note here is that the pipes were not played until the charge itself, or until within 100 yards of the enemy, so as not to draw undue attention to the advancing force or drown out orders. This would of course change during trench warfare, where the trench lines were often only a short distance apart to begin with. If the enemy was pushed back, and any counterattacks beaten off, the work did not end. The next duty of the attacking force was to secure the position, not by occupying the enemy's old firing line, as this will be known to the enemy and hostile artillery could easily be brought to bear on that position, but by selecting defensive positions beyond it. From then on, the manual of infantry training dictates that the enemy should be pursued relentlessly by day and night, without regard to exhaustion. Those in the pursuit should be prepared to accept risks, and those who cannot keep up should be left behind. It's really applied only to large formations, of course. No one expected a single platoon or company to pursue the German army halfway across France. But it does emphasise the point that at all times during the advance and assault, initiative must be taken and acted upon with aggression. By the outbreak of the Great War, the British Expeditionary Force was one of the most tactically advanced armies in the world. Its legendary prowess and musketry was employed to its best effect by extensive training in methods of advance and defence, aspects of which still remain in use over a hundred years on. Gone were the days of mass formations marching upright into a hail of fire. Subordinate commanders and individual soldiers were given an unprecedented level of independence on the battlefield, while still working as small, well-oiled cogs in a much larger machine. Senior officers accepted that it was impossible to be everywhere and understand everything at once, and so put a much higher degree of trust in their juniors than in previous conflicts. But they were not complacent. Commanders knew that a battle could not be fought by fire alone, and so the advance by fire and the assault with the bayonet became one of the most important tactics of the period.